So NeurIPS 2020 was last week. Um, so this is a really, really brief trip report. Um, I didn't attend the whole thing. I sort of subsampled from it. I tried to get uh, a bunch of stuff out of it. Uh, Lucas, I think, tried to attend the whole thing uh, beginning to end as if he was really there full time. And I think Karan did something somewhere in between. So this is gonna be a pretty uh, quick uh, trip report. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just give sort of overall impressions of this, um, some of the positives and negatives. And then I picked three papers uh, to with one slide on each one um, uh, to talk about. Okay. Oh, looks like the line wrapping is all messed up. Okay. Um, so kind of my impressions of NeurIPS 2020, like three slides on this. So NeurIPS is always a massive conference. And as you might expect this time, it was fully virtual. Um, I think this was definitely the best online conference so far that I've been to. I've been to several, three others at least, and it's like far better experience than the other ones. Um, I would say from the other ones, I got almost nothing out of it. Whereas at least with NeurIPS, I got something out of it. Um, and I think clearly a huge amount of work has gone into creating the structure and really kudos to all of the conference organizers um, uh, for putting a huge amount of work into it. Uh, you could see just a lot of thought had gone into the structure and every little piece of it, uh, which is really nice. Um, I have some sort of overall mixed feelings about the format and really online conferences in general. So kind of here are the pros and cons um, as I kind of see it. So the positives. Um, so clearly this type of conference is far more accessible and, and it's hard to overstate the importance of this. Um, I think it was extremely cheap. Um, and if I recall correctly, they were very um, uh, generous about just giving, waiving the registration fee altogether for anyone who even said they could, had a hard time affording it. So basically anyone could attend it. There was no limits on registration as far as I could tell. Um, their schedule was, around the clock, they had stuff going on for every time zone in the world, uh, which is really interesting and, and nice. Um, it was fantastic, I think, for students, uh, those with physical challenges, um, um, you know, if you're in a wheelchair or anything like that, um, international researchers, anyone with funding issues and so on. So pretty much, you know, every, everyone, um, almost everyone can get the entire conference experience. Um, so again, it's hard to overstate this. Everyone is on the same level playing field. Um, so I thought that was really important. Um, uh, everything is recorded. Um, this is sort of true before as well. Um, uh, and, but I think it's more so this time around. Um, and the full conference materials are available afterwards. So this is gonna be a great resource for later as well. Um, and they're gonna open it up for everyone soon. And uh, I felt the poster session was really the best part of it. <laughs> um, uh, originally, it felt hokey. There was this gather town UI. I think I showed that in a previous research meeting where you had this sort of virtual uh, field where there were like these simulated tables and a little icon that would walk around and, and go to different things. And as you got closer to a poster, you would start seeing the other people there. And then you could press a key and you'd see the full poster in front of you and the videos of everyone there and you could then start interacting and it was all based on kind of this physical proximity. Um, yeah, was there a, a new platform they used for this? I'm yeah, sure yeah, so it was called, exactly, yeah, it was called gather.town. Um, so Is I that think the whole a, conference or is that just for the uh, poster sessions? It was for the poster sessions and for some of the socials, they did the same thing um, and maybe for workshops, I don't know, um, but it, it at, when I first heard about it, it felt really hokey. <laughs> like people were trying to force feed a uh, physical thing, but actually it was really fun and worked well, um, I thought. So that was, that was, uh, that was pretty nice. Um, oh, I should say, this is far better than let's say what happened at Mises with posters, uh, where it was really almost zero interaction with the posters as far as I could tell. Um, so this, this was really nice. Um, um, I think the overall UI for the conference was better than past years. I think because they were forced, they knew everything was gonna be online. It wasn't a secondary thing. It was like the main 
focal point for everyone in the conference. So they put a lot more effort into it. Um, and so, you know, it's easier to find stuff that's interesting. Everything's nicely hyperlinked. The videos, chats, and paper were all kind of nicely organized. Um, every poster has a three minute video recording. Uh, every poster has a page and in there, there's a three minute video recording and a chat box as well, if you want to leave things there and you could, it was really nice to be able to watch this brief recording of the poster before you went to the poster. Um, I found that was very useful rather than just going to the poster. Uh, Cause if you just go to the poster, you know, you're in the middle, you know, they're in the middle of discussions with someone else and it's, it takes a while before you can ask them to give a walkthrough, for example. But if you've already done the walkthrough ahead of time, then you can go in and just participate in the in the questions and interactions. So I thought that was actually more efficient. Um, it's funny, that sounds, you know, when you have to do it in a real poster session, you just gotta have to hang out there, wait for an opportunity to-, to Yeah, exactly. And you didn't really have to- restart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you didn't have to do that here. And, and the recording, you could go faster. <laughs> yeah, and, and sometimes you give up. Sometimes you're waiting for so long for the chance to hear this pitch, you just ask, screw it, I'm gonna yeah. go on. Exactly, you give up and, uh, so this was this was um, uh, pretty nice. I, th I think they should do that always, um, even for physical conferences. So. Did, did they give? Uh, was there a way of just looking over the whole set of tables and seeing where people were clustering? Yeah, yeah. Um, in the UI, uh, it was it was like um, a Space Invaders kind of field, if you can imagine, like a grid of posters with a lot of space in between, but right. a grid of posters, and you could see everyone else's icons, so you could see where people were clustered. Um, and, and, you know, like in the real NeurIPS, it was fairly crowded. There were people around everywhere. So I felt a lot of posters were getting attention uh, as opposed to like Nasus and some of the others. There were like only a handful of posters that really got any questions. The rest got zero questions as far as I could tell. And it was really hard to find them. Okay, yeah, so easy to find and uh, you could see people and you could, there was also like a Slack type UI on the left. You could see everyone who was in the poster room and so if you recognize someone or if you knew someone who was a friend, you could start chatting with them. You know, so it was uh, okay, so some so of those features. So did you, did you, they did a good job of making a, a, a virtual, uh, how to put it, an abstracted virtual reality experience of kind of wandering around, seeing where people are, where the activity is, where the buzz is. You can get you can glean that from the interface. So it you can like, glean that from the interface. Yeah. It was a little hard because NeurIPS is so huge, they had many post, many of these gather town rooms. So it was a little hard to ah, go okay. back and forth between them. But um, in, in, there were aspects of this that were better than the physical interaction, like the three minute video recording of the poster. And, um, and you know, you could actually, move, in NeurIPS, normally the poster session is huge, very crowded. It's actually hard to move. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of, it's like a Japanese crowded rush hour subway <laughs> thing. If you're, I don't know if you remember my pictures from last year, but it's actually hard to move from place to place. Whereas here, it's easy to move from place to place. And um, so that was that was kind of nice. So there are aspects of this actually better than the physical experience. Um, and you know, I think you saw from my Slack message, uh, I, I was really taken by the keynote by Charles Isbell. I think he took, <laughs> he exploited this online format and did a really high production value video uh, with some great messages and uh, very thoughtful video uh, on there. So that, that was pretty cool. You don't normally see that in talks. Um, and clearly this is great for the environment. There was no plane, you know, no, no one's flying planes are, are around the world. You don't have, you know, 10,000 people flying into Vancouver or wherever it is. So it was very green in that sense. Um, so that was, that was cool um, in there. Um, so kind of negatives, I mean, having said all this, for me personally, I'm done with virtual conferences. <laughs> I'm just uh, kind of sick of it. Um, you know, in the past, the real benefit for me of conferences was not so much the talks as really meeting people and having meaningful conversations. And I'm sure it's possible, but I didn't really experience any of that. I think if I'd done it in depth as much as Lucas did and really really force myself to find people and do this maybe I could have done it but I didn't really it, it sort of happens naturally in a physical conference I didn't it didn't happen naturally here um, so to me that that's a negative um, for me also I, I 
really like having a few times a year where I just go to a different physical location and I'm there for several days. It's a very helpful change of context for me. Um, and yeah, I, I take advantage of that. Um, I have, you know, I have chunks of time to myself uh, in a different place. That's, and I'm often, I've often been very creative from a research standpoint in that scenario. Um, and, um, you know, some other aspects of that is, you know, you're in a cool location like Vancouver or Lisbon as uh, Cosine was, seeing some of the local areas. It just completely puts you in a different frame of mind um, that's very different from being in an office. And here, it's not just in the office. I'm just stuck in my same office and the same chair in my house. <laughs> and so that like forced shift in physical change of context um, is to me very helpful. And it's really nice to have three of them a year or whatever, whatever I do. And, and um, I kind of rely on those kind of mileposts every year, uh, which I didn't really get in, in 2020. Um, and this, you know, kind of like Jeff was saying, you know, this gathered up town, there's actually like a plethora of services and accounts you need to create for to ex these various things. I found that really annoying. Um, and for, you know, some of the things like socials, they're like three or four different accounts you have to create and passwords and all of this. And I know I'm going to get marketing messages now from them. Uh, and it's just annoying. Um, um, and there was no integrated thing. And, and, it's understandable, it's not a fault of NeurIPS. There's no way they could have created all of these services themselves. So it's nice that they're there, but at the same time, it would have been nice if the signing and authorization process was sort of taken care of. Um, so Karan pointed this out to me, um, you know, despite all of this, they didn't have the WOVA app, which they've had uh, for the last couple of years in physical conferences. This is an app that's on your phone that you use to connect with other people at conferences. And I met a lot of people through the WOVA app in the conferences. And I think something like that would have been actually really useful here. And they, as far as I know, they, were, they didn't have that. At least I didn't see it. Maybe I missed it. Um, but I, uh, th that was kind of an odd omission. And so that's something I think they could put in into online conferences as well. Um, uh, so I, I guess my summary, you know, obviously, you know, we're kind of forced to deal with this online format over the last year. I think as with a lot of things with the pandemic, I think it's forced a lot of things to happen faster than they would have otherwise, but hopefully the best of online conferences uh, will then migrate to physical conferences. Uh, and maybe there will continue to be a lot of conferences that are fully online and, and maybe the number of physical conferences will be just a few. So you still don't travel as much, but um, uh, you know, you still have some uh, physical conferences, yet you can get a lot of the good stuff about the online features. That's what I'm hopeful for uh, down the road. So this is not, this shouldn't be a negative, I guess this is kind of a aside. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. And it's, it's kind of, in retrospect, it's good that in 2020, a lot of the stuff was, people were forced to innovate and forced to do things faster than they might have otherwise. Do you, you think there, there really is a hybrid model, like where some people are there physically and some people aren't there? It, it seems hard for me to imagine what that would be like. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, it's a good, I've been thinking about it. It's a good question. Um, it, it, it seems like they could retain, they could at least do it so that if you weren't there physically, you could still get a pretty good experience. Um, and so some of the stuff, for example, having these little recordings of the posters are having a lot more focus on a nice UI, things could be good. I think it'd be actually kind of cool to have a physical and a virtual poster session for every poster. Because um, each one has sort of different benefits. Um, to it. I don't know if that's possible, but there's uh, problems with that, but um, you know, the, it physical, you know, the poster sessions are really, I think, kind of the, I felt were the highlight of everything. So I'd focus on that. I don't know if there's really a need for oral sessions, frankly. Um, I don't know what, you, know, you could just you have recordings like live, of videos. Like live talks. Yeah, live talks. I don't know, is that really- I mean, like, important? for example, yeah, the, the, the keynote you passed around, I mean, that was, that couldn't have been done live. 
It couldn't have been live. Yeah, like exactly. Stage, could do stage things. performance. <laughs> yeah, so I think you know the, you could select some people to have longer video recordings um, that they could submit in advance and maybe make sure. I mean, they all have posters anyway. All the orals have posters, I think. So you just have a poster session for them, and they maybe just get a spotlighted recorded talk. I don't know. It makes oh, sense so for like everyone every, to every, go into these big rooms and nurse yeah. and go from one room to the other and running between. You know, I want to see one talk from this session, another talk from this session. It's just there's no benefit that you don't interact with the person anyway, because it's huge. Well, so it's, there are no live talks, but all the questions were live. So there is sort of a mix there. I mean, you exactly. Watch, and uh, exactly. And you could still do that. Uh, there's no, you could still do that. That doesn't require a huge physical room. Right. And, and so you could still have a time uh, where people chat and, and interact with the quote unquote oral presenter. Um, you know, they could do that and you could do that in their poster sessions too. Um, so mm -hmm. I think those those are good things about it. Uh, and this, I don't see any need really for big oral physical talks. Um, so so yeah, I, th I think there's some, some learnings from it that you can apply to physical conferences. Can you really have a hybrid model? Um, I'm not sure, I think you can do it so that there's some things that are really good online and some things that are good physical and just put them in the same conferences and conference and um, I don't see a big downside to that. So anyway. you mentioned you mentioned spotlight. What's the difference between the spotlight and oral? Oh oh in this conference? Uh, I, think I think they had spotlights. I think they had so in the past what they would well I don't know actually in the past what they would do is they have an oral talk which is you know 20 minutes or whatever. Then they pick a few posters that, that where they each have two or three minutes talk to, to give a spotlight on their poster session. So they're in front of everyone in this big room and they get three minutes to explain their, their poster. So that's typically what a spotlight session is. Yeah, the, Here, the, every poster had a video, three minute video. Um, you know, so I think that's actually better. Those three minute spotlights, you don't really get much out of it. But uh, during the conference, the difference was uh, in the sessions, the oral sessions, the oral talks were a bit longer, like 10, 15 minutes with questions afterwards. And the spotlights were like five to eight minutes and they were like in a sequence of three or four and just yeah. a time for questions at the end. So the difference was just like time allotted for it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so that, that you know, maybe you could still do that. And maybe some posters get more than three minutes to talk about them. I found the three minute, recording to be ideal because the, you're going to see the details in the poster and the paper anyway and the three minute you're forced to kind of describe the highlights of it um, and I found that actually more helpful than the longer talks um, but you know most of them are not three minutes I don't know maybe it's an average from the papers you're seeing but a lot of them are like 10 8 5 I don't know there is yeah no yeah, I wonder. I wondered. I, I saw a few that were most of the ones I saw were three minute, but there were some that were longer. So I, I, won, I wondered if I, think I don't know whether I made it to the oral presentation, so they just recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't have like a shorter version. To go exactly. Yeah. Was, was there any um, for for the the little uh, uh, either the posters themselves or the poster or the short poster talks? Was there any kind of uh, uh, liking liking mechanism where uh, the people would kind of upvote these things and so that would uh, drive traffic toward them? No, there, there was nothing like that um, as far as I could see. Uh, just physically you could see where people, uh, you know, the, the people are gathering. I know there were some meetups that were, that would highlight specific papers or posters after the fact. So there were things like that, but uh, nothing like a ratings or a review system or anything like that. Yeah, the thing I used to like about SIGGRAPH, uh, I'm not sure they're still doing it, was that they finally came down to a format where uh, you'd all gather in a room, but what they would do is each each paper uh, would basically give like a one minute quick, you know, uh, blitz of, you know, you know, with the iconic, here's the images, here's the concept, here's the thing, please come see our talk type of thing. And it was yeah. good to just kind of dedicate yourself to sitting through that because then you get exposed to a lot of stuff rather than, you know, I'm not really interested in this stuff, but if they make a compelling argument, you could kind of jump your thinking into something really, truly new. Yeah, yeah. So they had that in the form of these short videos for each each thing. Uh, they didn't have it in a sequence like, like you're ex explaining, but you could go and 
yeah. things. Uh, for me, I'm not sure I would find a rating system helpful because my my interests tend to be different from 90% of machine learning people. So um, I would rather have a much better UI for finding things by topic or keywords. I found the search functions not to work too well. Uh, they had this visualization, if you want, I can show it where they clustered different papers and they had, you know, you could look at what these clusters were. I didn't find that very helpful. Um, so some sort of nice browse, uh, improved browsing and search mechanism would have been better. But it was still, the UI was much better than previous years. That, that makes sense because the heterogeneity of, of the community is probably vast at this point. Yeah. So, and, and Europe's is huge. It's really huge. So I think search is more important in that context. Yeah, but I, I missed something like that. I, I, I really didn't like the oral presentations. I think the, the categorization of papers were not good. So mm -hmm. there's a, a category like continuous slash meta slash misc learning. And there are like all sorts of paper in there. You yeah. Know, <laughs> each other at all so yeah. it was kind of a mess and i gave up on them real quick but the workshops were amazing or the best i've ever seen and i think the workshops they do a really good job of like filtering you know like uh what are the important papers and organizing them in the sequence and putting like some debate on the end so yeah so maybe you can talk more about that because I, I i think quite often i find the workshops are the highlights of conferences anyway um yeah again the oral sessions to me i think you can just get rid of them they're not very useful, the physical, doing it physically. Um, and, they have, and they have an oral session that's called uh, deep learning, which is kind of strange. <laughs> I know, it's like, what? <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so I picked three papers uh, to just talk about briefly, and then we can switch to either Karana or Lucas, and maybe one of you could go over the workshops because I didn't spend as much time on that. Um, so I just picked three papers on the same topic, which is contrastive learning. Um, and I, I thought there, was a, there were a lot of interesting papers on this topic in, at NeurIPS. So to me, that was uh, kind of, if I had to pick one focus, that would be, that would be it. Um, uh, so contrastive learning, just as background, it's an unsupervised learning paradigm. Um, it's very similar to the way we think about predictive doing learning by prediction with one twist to it. Uh, so the basic idea is that you want to have a network that does a good job of predicting different examples of the same category. So you can imagine like rotated versions of an object. Um, you know, if you have a model of an object, you want to, as you move around it, you want to, you want to be able to predict what you're sensing. Um, so this is defined very generically and broadly as uh, just different examples of the same category. So um, you want to have, this forces the network to have representations that are as not quite invariant, but informative of the same category. So if you have two dogs, they're going to have very similar representations versus a dog and a mountain or something, right? And, and the way they do that is, so you, you want to do a good job at predicting different examples of the same category, and you want to do a bad job at predicting examples from different categories. So you want your representation between a dog one and dog two to be informative, but between a dog and a mountain or a dog and a car to be very different. So it's the second line that's, that I think really adds the power of it is that it, it enforces representations to be kind of less overlapping and, and disentangled in some way. Well, you know, it's funny because it, that does immediately bring up the problem of, well, what's different? I mean, yes. You know, a dog and a mountain are pretty different. A dog and a camel are less different. And, yeah. you know, how do you represent that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the whole, a lot of the trick is like, how do you set these things up? <laughs> and and how do you get it to work? And I keep, I'm just thinking that going around in the back of my head all, all the time is, can the neocortex do anything like this second line uh, of having, in some sense, things that you should be bad at predicting? Uh, and, and use that in the learning role. And, and I think there's some interesting ways that could happen in the neocortex and that's maybe a topic for a future research meeting. Um, do they do any pre-training on the network? Well, this is all unsupervised. So this is all in some sense pre-training because then then at the end you put a simple classifier at the top. Oh, I didn't end this sentence here to actually do the classification. So you can think of this whole thing as pre-training. 
Yeah, or you can integrate with training, right? It doesn't have to be pre-training, but it can be pre-training. Yeah, because because I was I was thinking your uh, uh, what it, it interprets as a difference could be they can make a poor choice as to what a difference is as as it was kind of uh, as as Jeff was kind of mentioning. So if you have a pre-trained one, but then starting with a whole new set of categories, at least you have some basis on, on similarity to inform it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm just wondering what it actually comes up with as a difference. Yeah, and I think in most cases, um, it's just whatever happens by chance and most things will be quite different and very few things will be similar if you have a large enough data set. And so it, yeah, but maybe you could do, I'll talk about a few variations of this that, that I thought were interesting that maybe speak to this stuff. Um, uh, good question. Is there a choice of unsupervised learning as opposed to self-supervised learning? Uh, um, uh, this is self-supervised, I guess. And okay. okay. I, I, there are no labels. Okay. Uh, you know, you don't need external labels. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the distinction is kind of blurred between unsupervised and self-supervised. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, so, you know, of course, no labels are required for the most part, except you have a very simple classifier at the top for actually doing the categorization. And this has been gaining traction over the last couple of years, really over the last year. And there were a bunch of interesting papers on this at Europe. So I picked three to talk about. And I, I should <laughs> caution you, none of these do I know in depth. So as soon as you ask me questions, I'm going to fall off a cliff. Um, I'm confused but, about something, though. You say no labels are required, but you have to have a classification for every image, right? Um, only at only at the end. Uh, well, so how do you, you know? What, how you do you know though. something's in the same category and a different category? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, there's different variations of it. it, so maybe I should I should change this. It's in the classic one, you do need you you do have labels because you need to know they're different or the same. Uh, so you yeah. do need to know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in in some of these variations, you don't actually. Okay. Have labels except for the classifier. All right, I'll, I'll see. Yeah. So that's the yeah. So I should I should tweak this sentence. But you, you can still learn how to disentangle uh, representations without having the labels. And I, are you going to show Sinclair? No, because that's a previous one. I'm just showing focusing on three papers that are here. A lot of them compared their stuff to Sinclair, which was one of which was one of the original ones. Okay, but, but the idea behind most of these, but even Sinclair is just learning how to disentangle representations and and we can see it in our cases, learning like sparse representations that you know can be easily disentangled and you don't need labels to do that. Well, but, if you need to know that something is a different category from, from you know, yours, the whole thing, you of, you've got this that, contrast of learning, it's, it's not just yeah. uh, categorization, it's you need to know. It's, it's in yeah, so some of, some of what they do, um, for example, is they take a batch of images you're learning one image one, and you just assume all the rest of the images in the batch are from a different category. And so that's not gonna be strictly true, but if you have a thousand categories, you know the vast majority of them are gonna be from different categories. Well, so you don't strictly need the label. One could just assume, assume that. It. It's funny yeah. because in real life, the, the uh, successive uh, inputs to the brain would almost certainly be from the same category. But if you just assume you're taking random pictures off the internet, you can assume statistically they're going to be different <laughs> categories. <laughs> now my exactly. work is fine. <laughs> yeah. Kind of the opposite. Yeah. So. Maybe in real life, uh, you know, you could do some sort of a mental switch of, okay, now I'm looking at yeah. a different object okay. or now I'm looking at something else. They good, are, good, enough. good enough. Yeah. So that's one way you can get around strictly having labels. But, 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 but um, so, without the label, can still like group um, which things are similar to which things are different. So you're gonna learn representations which are gonna be similar for things which are similar and different for things which are different. And and that yeah, you just have to make sure you don't get into a kind of a tautology where you, you know then the entire thing becomes how it's all about finding things which are similar anyway. Uh, so if you already know what's similar, then why do you need to find it? You know. Um, no, but if you don't have the labels and if you do this pre-processing and then if you learn this representation a very disentangled, then with a simple K and N at the end, you can just, you know, like, oh, let me look for embeddings which are, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's this third line here. Sorry? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's this third line here. You just need a simple classifier at the top. Yeah. Well, I'm arguing the fact that you don't need labels at all to learn disentangled representations. 
but uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. The, well, uh, that that's true. It's just Jeff was saying, well, the way I phrased it here, it looks like you need to know whether something's the same category or something's different uh -huh. categories. Yeah, and, uh, um, okay, so one, one interesting uh, paper uh, that I want to dig a little bit deeper into is that you try to predict an object from different views. Um, so uh, you have an image and you do different augmentations of it, like rotations and so on. And, you, and then you try to make sure you can predict uh, that same object from different views. Um, and then you cluster the object views. Um, there's a, cl a clustering uh, thing there where you try to find views that don't do well at predicting one another. So that's kind of the contrastive piece in some sense. And they also have a way of doing multi-resolution augmentation. So you can co also compare views at different scales. And the nice thing about this is that it's all done with augmentations. So you can do it all in the same memory footprint, uh, essentially, and you don't need to do all these pairwise comparisons with other images. And so it's very efficient. Uh, it can be all done in kind of the same loop. And what they found is doing this, um, I think this was the best results I saw. Um, with ResNet 50, they got about 75.3% top one accuracy, which is really close to the best supervised uh, examples, which are somewhere around 70, you know, 76 and a half percent, they, they said here, this green one. Uh, so their method is very close to that. Um, and so that, that's really encouraging. And you can see SimClear is still, you know, it's way better than SimClear for the same number of parameters. I don't know SimClear very well, but um, that description kind of matches at least my mental model of SimClear. So I don't know how deep- Yeah, they, they have views, but they're, 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 I think one of the novel things is this, the way they cluster these different views. Oh, I see. Um, so if you have a view of an object, like if you have a view of a car from the side versus one from the bottom, they're this different views of the same object, but you can't really, it's not easy to predict one from the other. And so you might wanna have both of, you might wanna have both of those views as, as you know, clusters of this object. So uh, anyway, I need to spend more time on this. I'm, I'm probably decim you know, massacring the actual <laughs> technique. Um, the second one was uh, one where, another one where you don't really need negative samples. And what they're doing is, this is the, the top one is the main network you're learning. Um, and then they have a moving average of the top network as your contrastive network, it's the one below. So it's a slowly moving average of that. It's not learned as well as this network. And what you do is you take the same image and you do different views or augmentations of it. And you try to make sure that they don't, are not good at predicting one another. <laughs> so it uses an older version of the same network essentially as the negative target. Um, and so they- That's what? weird, that's not obvious to me. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it, yeah it's, it's just, this is a network that's not as good as this one in some sense. Uh, it, it was, kind of intriguing to me because you have different, from a neuroscience standpoint, you have different scales of plasticity going on. And so I don't know if there's any correlation, but anyway, this is a slower learning network and this is the, the more current network there. Um, they got improved results, although not as good as uh, these guys here. And the third paper, I thought that one's a really good way of like framing the problem, at least from machine learning perspective. I mean, not going to neuroscience. Aspect. Yeah, it's hard to know why this is really working yet. Uh, but I mean, it makes sense, right? Like you want <laughs> your previous representation of it, it. It's you want to distance from that one, and you get, you want to get closer to the. Uh, yeah, the but now, but right? it but it's not clear to me how it really disentangles representations from different categories. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I need to look at that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and the third one was in the vein of local contrastive representation learning. So the the traditional one is an is on the left here. You have a traditional feed forward network, and you're doing this contrastive error right at the top, and you still have to do backprop all the way back. Um, if you remember Cindy Lowe's presentation from our Brains to Bay meeting. Uh, a few weeks ago, 
in her work, she made it completely local. So there's no backprop at all. So you're doing this contrastive loss at every layer of the network independently. So this is much more biologically plausible. Uh, there's no sort of backprop throughout, but you, you, know, you still need to do this contrastive loss at every level. And she got nice results there, but not as good as the full end-to-end. Um, and what this paper, Loco, does is sort of builds on Cindy's work by adding a feedback connection between two layers. So it's somewhere in between here and there. <laughs> it's like a, um, and here they are doing backprop in this red arrow. They're still doing backprop, but it's intriguing to think about, can we do it as an actual real feedback connection? Um, it's more of a you know, backwards prediction, if you will. Um, and this, by doing, by adding just one of this backward connection, they were able to get significantly better accuracies than uh, Cindy's thing. So you just have a, need a little bit more information between levels. Um, you can do it. Um, yeah, so overall, um, you know, it, it's just very intriguing to think about what's going on with contrastive loss. Um, and how it relates to prediction in the brain. I might not, I think the intuitive idea of finding things that you wanna be different from is a really nice idea. And if it was, would be really, it's just a, uh, really interesting to think about that is, is something like that going on in the brain. As you can yeah. see here, there are lots of different ways of doing it. It's not really the labels. There's many different ways of trying to force yourself to be different. Sparsity is one example of that in some sense. The K winner take all forces you to be different from others, but it may be that there's something else that's needed as well. Yeah, I don't know. The only thing that jumps out at me is like, yeah, the, the, the sparsity plus boosting, right? You know, you're forcing representations to spread apart, but mm -hmm. but uh, this is, I, I have to think about it. It's, it's not clear to me immediately, like nothing jumps to my mind saying, oh yeah, this is a major principle to be going on in the brain. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's yeah. a, a little strange. <laughs> it's a little strange. Uh, some of the one work they've done is they, you, you try to predict the image patch that's right next to you. So you can think about a cortical column trying to predict what's in the neighboring cortical column, which is similar to how our lateral, lateral connections work. Yeah. Um, but if it's far away from you, you want to be do a bad job at predicting it. Um, I don't know if those connections exist in the neocortex, so there's any information. I don't know. I mean, I mean, that doesn't even seem right to me. It's like, well, depending on how far away you are. I mean, you would, you would, if if an image was occupying a large part in your retina, you would. It seems like a goal would be everyone's trying to reach the same consensus. We're all looking at the dog. We're all looking at the mountain. And I just I yeah, assume that it, the, the tail of the dog is going to be different than the head of the dog. It doesn't seem to be the right, right assumption. Right. So there's a scaling thing. So I don't know if we could take care of that or not, but. Anyway, it's just intriguing to, yeah. there's certainly a lot of cases where if you move far away from the retina, it is a very different thing. Yeah, but even then we, we might, you know, really the details only right in the foveal point. And then, uh, and then even then we can attend to subsets of the input space. And I mean, it's almost like the brain saying, don't even look at that far enough stuff, you know? Yeah. So it, it is intriguing to me because variations on this are, are tempting to me when I think about building predictive models. Uh, when I think of if you want, um, if you want, say, a cortical column to learn a representation of its input, um, not, not for categorization. I mean, I'm just putting that aside. Can, you want cortical column to do something spatial pooler like you want it to represent the input somehow. Uh, and um, one way people do that is they'll they'll aim for reconstruction error. They'll 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 try to represent it in a way that they can reconstruct the image. Uh, but a different way that's kind of based on this idea would be um, you want uh, what you want it to learn. You what you want the cortical column to learn is uh, is you you want this input to um, have a low anomaly score. Uh, when this when this input arrives again, you 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 want to not be surprised. Um, but if a different input arrives, you want to be surprised. Like if if yeah. an input from like five meters over arrives, or or turn the head to the left, if that input arrives, you want that to cause surprise. Uh, and so this this kind of gives you a a a, a complete objective uh, where you want the current input to map to something that's not surprising. You want other inputs to map to some things that are surprising. 
so so in that sense i would totally like use something like this in, in, in still, a way that fits yeah. our models it's still confusing to me i mean like if i'm looking at something and i turn left i'm trying to predict what's there i mean i you know i should use my model world to constantly predict it's almost That's separate like I, from this i'm talking I, about training a spatial cooler at analog okay uh, and so i guess i'm not following i'm sorry yeah so the question the to translate into kind of uh, plasticity rules it would be you know you'd want to do something like habian learning or you know uh, for situations where you know it's it's the same thing and you want to do anti habian learning for if you somehow know that it's has is different in some way um and and it, it, you know as this paper shows that that could be as simple as just the representations from some time ago you know or maybe representations that are far away from you and physically in the and so even mm -hmm. a little bit of that might really help learning maybe you don't have maybe this could even be a weak factor in the in the, in the thing and maybe maybe boosting does some of that naturally as well um i don't know i mean boosting does do some of that naturally uh, but it's not clear if that's sufficient yeah. uh, to me cindy lowe's work was really eye-opening because it's it's the first time i've seen local completely local learning rules uh that do as well as a completely end-to-end -end global training system um, and it's been very difficult to figure out how to stack layers um, where the stacking actually helps uh, in, in traditional unsupervised learning. So. Okay, that's all for my part of it. You know, the, the boots, bootstrap your own uh, latent paper, it's reminiscent of the self-play that's done at alpha zero. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the way they've done it, so they needed a lot of uh, variety to get their agents to play against other agents. So they started using saving older versions of the agents and play against those. And, and in order to specialize against something, they started to create like forks of the, those agents that were specialized, for example, at attacking, I don't know, attacking something or building something else like in StarCraft. And then they would play against those versions of agents. So they would, like somehow somewhere along the way, they would save versions of the model and use those like to, to train their newest version. So the yeah, this is something actually Jerry Tesoro talked about a lot in his backgam and TD gammon stuff, because uh, he was worried about that when, you know, a lot of what AlphaGo does, I think, just builds on Jerry's work. <laughs> uh, so in TD gammon, he was very worried initially that um, that the network would just lead go into some sort of a corner case where it's just playing in a very simple version of the game and just uh, and not really learning uh, strategy. So when it, it, because you're just playing yourself, you could just uh, do a very simple version and, and do okay, you wouldn't learn necessarily do well against a master backgammon player or someone who might have very different strategies. So he did a lot of stuff with randomization and backgammon is normal, naturally random because of the, because you, there's a roll of a die, which really helps. And in Go, you don't have the roll of a die. So you have to do some of these other methods, but he he was very careful to think through that and and um, work through those issues. Okay, Karan Lucas who wants to go. That was a little longer than I thought it would be. <laughs> it always is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can um, share a few things about the workshops that I noticed. Um, so a couple of trends that I, I think I'll touch on two points from the workshops, um, which are my favorite part. So um, first, there's this big, uh, I guess, um, concern right now in the field about, um, you know, right now, people are really um, focusing on getting high accuracy in their models. And, and that's really what's driving, um, you know, publications forward. And so, you know, a lot of people, like especially um, Yashra Benju, for example, he had a talk at a workshop where he talked about, you know, this is not the right incentive structure we, uh, for researchers. And he, he's, he's proposed a um, couple alternative methods that he thinks um, would be better. Uh, and so and that, that means like focusing less on, uh, I guess, f having fewer conference papers and focusing more on having high quality papers as opposed to a lot of the papers we see today. Because a lot of the papers we see today at conferences, you know, the, the accuracy is really high in all these models. But 
I think in terms of the impact in the long run, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really go too far. And, and so his talk made me remember three years ago when I was at Neurips, um, I spoke to, um, I, was, I was speaking with someone and they were telling me, you know, 70% of the papers here are probably gonna be forgotten in about three months from now. And I feel like that is many times the case. So um, that, that was- Did, did he have a specific yeah. proposal about what to do alternate to, to the sort of benchmark, incremental benchmarkism? Yeah, so he he did. Um, I I didn't write it down exactly, but from what I remember, it was it was along the lines of um, you know have have um, I guess people they shouldn't um, when reviewers are evaluating papers. Um, one met one thing they should look at apart from you know accuracy on benchmarks is how far is this going to go in the future? Like how like is it going to have a really long term impact? Um, so, something like that. And, and I think they've, they've started to put these sort of things into effect because this year for New Europe submissions, they had a new mandatory section at the end called broader impact. So, I mean, it's not, it, it's, it's actually, like it's, five years ago, I had this uh, lunch with Andrew Ng and I was talking about this topic and he did, he said to me, he says, you know, your work is not going to be paid attention by anyone because all they care about is, you know, benchmark performance, and, and you're not talking about that, and so no one's going to pay attention to your work. <laughs> and I was arguing with at the time, like, well, you well, we have these new ideas, and the ideas are important because no one cares. He said, so it's interesting that it's just interesting that here we go. Uh, you know, he said it was Ashu. He talked about the Benjamin, was it? Yeah, yeah, he spoke yeah. about that. Interesting. So I, I can argue exactly the opposite of what he's arguing in some sense. That, uh, well, maybe it's not the opposite, but. I, I could, the thing about doing this online conferences and stuff is that there's no physical limit to what you can have in the conference, right? Uh, and so why not make it a much broader pool instead of having a really, I think what you were saying is he's saying have a smaller set of papers. I'm saying have a larger set of papers, uh, have a very lightweight review system. Maybe it's sort of open-ended and stuff and make the reviews openly available and some ways to sort by reviews, but everyone can sort it themselves. Um, and why, and then those who are interested in benchmarks, that's fine. I mean, let them, let them find the papers that have good benchmark reviews. Um, but for those who are looking for novel things, let them, let them find it. And if you have something novel, let, you know, allow you to present it at this. Why have, um, you know, with archive, you know, the limit of going through a journal process is, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's been released as, you know, everyone can openly uh, publish stuff. So maybe I might make conferences. Uh, yeah, maybe I think it's maybe much a hybrid. more lightweight. Uh, yeah, but it's more hybrid. The hybrid much is more lightweight. One... There's still some. Maybe there's still some way to rank it or sort it. And maybe if you have a physical conference, you still need some some limitation of some sort. But the conference itself shouldn't necessarily impose that. So I, I think in the uh, way I, you looked at the different slide that I looked at, I looked at it. Hey, we should be trying to put a light on people who aren't just doing. Uh, uh, benchmark performance, you know, and maybe that's what you said, Karen. They had that, but but you, but the idea you're pointing out that he was saying let's limit the other ones. I agree with you. We shouldn't limit anything. You know, let people yeah, publish whatever need, they want. Exactly. But she's I, saying there are too many papers, and we should limit that. I don't think so. So, but uh, I, I heard I it the other way around. I need different. I think we should have different sorting criteria. Yeah, I, I heard it the other way around, saying we should we should give more credence in in, in attention to papers that aren't like that, which I could still argue. For. It just says do more as opposed to, I, I could argue that I, I like that idea, you know, again, my conversation with Andrew Ng was like to the point, right? So I like the idea. So I guess I'm agreeing with you, but I, I'm focusing on a different side. Of it. Yeah, the trick would be different ways of finding good quality papers. Or, or uh, just, or yeah, just a different ways of a different metrics um, besides yeah. just accuracy, yeah. you know, well, I don't know what those are. So I think he was actually advocating to have fewer papers at conferences, and he he was emphasizing having more high quality papers in you know things like journals like JMLR. Yeah, but but who decides what's high quality? If you have fewer papers, it's like it gets more and more elite, um, and it's you know someone still has to decide what the high quality means, and it's really hard to predict what's a good paper. Um, you, know, you know what's really going to be impactful years from now. It's really hard to predict that. Um, you let the people decide, right? That's what. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I think I agree. exactly. Yeah. So, um, but and that that tied in with uh, with another talk that I saw just a little bit later by Bass Veeling, who I think is Cindy Lowe's um, 
a lab mate and he talked about uh, the exact same problem especially in, in the context of like you know neuro and uh, neuroscience techniques being applied to machine learning why we see so few is because uh, you know, the accuracy generally tends to be the bottleneck for people just because a lot of these initial methods aren't able to get, aren't able to compete with the accuracy that a lot of these other techniques are getting that you tend to, you tend that this area tends to be very underexplored in conferences like in Europe's. Agreed. Amen. <laughs> yeah, but he, but he, but he didn't, and I really liked his talk about it, um, especially, especially since he talked about, you know, this being like the, the great filter, that, that's what he called it. Um, but he didn't propose any alternative to what we can, what we can do about it. Um, and then the, the second thing I wanted to, uh, the second thing I noticed in uh, workshops that I wanted to add was that, you know, right now a big, another big trend in, uh, I guess the machine learning field is bias in machine learning. And so the link, the talk that Subutai linked to by Charles Isbell talked a lot about this, how, you know, machine learning models can be inadvertently racist because that's just the data that they've been trained on. And, um, and so I was, I was listening to a panel with, uh, with, with, with a couple of people and then they, they brought up, um, they were asked at one point what their views are on um, this uh, this uh, blog post that Rich Sutton, who's one of the pioneers in machine learning, wrote. It's called the Bitter Lesson, and I actually haven't read it myself, but I've heard summaries of it so many times. It's it's basically saying, based on you know seventy years of AI research, the the one thing that stands uh, or the the one um, lesson we can take away is that you know the thing that ends up winning in the end is just the simpler method coupled with higher compute. So as compute has gotten better, it's the simpler methods that have won out and all the really fancy ideas have sort of died away. Um, and so Rich Sutton is arguing here that like, you know, it's, it's the compute that's gonna ultimately drive changes in the future. And I think most people in the field do agree with that. But one thing this um, panel brought up, which I found very interesting was that they said, okay, sure. I mean, it depends what your objective is in the end, right? If your objective is just to get higher accuracy, then sure, maybe, this is um, higher compute is going to win out, but the cost of this is that you know we're seeing things like bias in machine learning, which is a result of if you're just you know having few, fewer and fewer inductive biases and just relying on compute. And so that's, I think. So Rich Sutton wrote this about almost two years ago, and I think um, the the community as a whole has realized since then that hey, there are still even though you know in, in terms of accuracy, uh, higher compute is great. Um, it's we're still running into a lot of other problems. So uh, people are starting to realize that you know this is not this might not be the way forward. If I can just put things in perspective, uh, I think we're talking about accuracy as, as like supervised learning is the only paradigm machine learning, but half of it is reinforcement learning. That's half of yeah. it. That's where rich is coming from. Yeah, reinforcement learning. There are several ways of defining reward, and the way you define uh, your reward or whatever, or a function to define intrinsic reward defines the pro problem you're optimizing for. So for example, in multi-agent reinforcement learning, you can define uh, objectives which are not related to maximizing the reward. You can define objectives that are rela related to fairness, for example, making sure that everyone, every agent gets at least a little bit or at least you know enough, or you can define objectives related to maximizing the total utility if you want. So there are several different ways of defining that in reinforcement learning. So it's not, you can still, uh, customize and make it fair through the way you create, you define the problem, right? And that's different from just the accuracy problem in supervised learning. Okay, I think yeah, I think the panel was focusing more on the yeah. the, in the supervised learning setting. But in some perspective, because Rich is coming from that background, you know. Yeah. Which workshops did you attend, Karan, that you found interesting? Um, so, so there was actually, there were actually two workshops or there was one workshop focused on, I think it was some, the name was something on the lines of an alternative publication model. And that's where Yashua Benjo spoke about his proposal of, you know, we should change um, incentive structures. And then, so I spent some time at that. And then, um, I think this one here might've been at a fairness workshop, uh, when they talked about this stuff. Uh, and then I, so there were two neuroscience slash biology related workshops. So there was one called biological and artificial reinforcement learning. And then there was another one, uh, which was beyond backprop. Uh, and Cindy Lowe is one of the organizers of that. Um, so I spent a lot of time at those. Um, but there were a lot of other workshops, which I just went into just based on who was talking or if there was a panel or something like that. Um, the one thing that was really great from a workshop perspective uh, at this conference is that, you know, um, usually I, I want to go to a lot of different workshops because they all have panels and I, I like listening to panel discussions and getting people's views on things but 
Uh, and then usually if you're, if you're there in person, you have to run around between workshops. But here it's like, I could be in four workshops at the same time uh, and just have three <laughs> of them muted and I could um, go between them, so. Yeah, it's kind of like the poster session. It's so much easier to flip back and forth between posters uh, in the online setting than in the physical world, yeah. Um, any papers you want to talk about or anything like that or um, I I don't really have anything to add in terms of papers. I'm still going through some of them myself. Okay, Lucas. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to spend two months going through everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, in terms of experience, um, I think so I had everything. What I can add is I was excited to watch it live, but the conference for me was 5 to 11 a.m. and 5 to 11 p.m., which were really bad times for me, <laughs> especially because at evenings, I have a hard time managing the pain. So, I mean, it wasn't an option for me to watch a conference 5 to 11. So I had to discard the live part of it. Um, I did watch the invited talks live and the, the posters, the poster session for me were the highlight. I really lo I loved Getter Tom. I think it was a great format, but it was kind of unusable. If you really like tried it in music, because at least for me, I had a lot of connection issues. And by connection issues, I mean, I was like talking to someone and it would drop for like five seconds, but those five seconds were enough for me to like lose the thread of the conversation. And that happened so many times that at some point you just give up, you know? So if there were no connection issues, I think it would be amazing. But with the connection issues, after two or three days, you just give up. You know, I, I was just like walking around the posters and checking the videos and that's how I just gave up on talking to people. So I think there's potential there, but. Yeah, they, they were, they kind of anticipated that. And I think the idea was that if there are too many people are, well, they also had a Zoom link set up for every poster. So you could switch over into Zoom, but I didn't see anyone using that. It's just too awkward. Um, yeah, you know, if you're in the flow of having people coming in and out, it's just really hard to say, okay, let's go into a Zoom link. Uh, yeah. So I didn't see anyone use that. It was such a great format because, like, like in posters, you usually know you everybody get, gathers around and you can't hear and you have, you know, like you get very. Close. <laughs> but in this case, you could have fifty people in the poster and everyone could hear just fine. Yeah, and yeah. There, I think there are many benefits of the online, but it has to be well executed. And I think connection was a big issue. Even in the invited talks, I kept losing connection. So, um, was that local to you, or did uh, the other people, uh, did Subutai and uh, Karant have the same problem? Um, I didn't face it as much, but I did notice it was sluggish sometimes. But I didn't have connection issues too much. Is this Gather Town specifically? Gather Town specifically, yeah. It wasn't too bad for me. But one thing I found that was really strange was that when I was in a group where people are someone's talking, sometimes if I joined the group. Um, half the people I can't hear them so I just thought that like people are just um, here silently not doing anything but it turns out they're listening to someone else who for some reason I can't hear which sounds like a bug on their end no it's how you set your status there's like a button you can set you know you can put in the moon or in the minus and depends on how you set your status it tells you if you're listening to people or not but it's, it's kind of weird but you get used to it uh, uh, anyhow um let's see yeah, so one thing that Carolina was talking about that really resonates with me is how in 70% of the papers are going to be forgotten in three months. <laughs> and I do believe that. And so I walk into new rips not thinking about... But is that different this year? I mean, I think that's true all the time. In fact, probably 95% of them will be forgotten. <laughs> and that's true in neuroscience too, right? I mean, it's, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's unique to this field. Yeah, yeah, I think it's true. It's true in general. It's just that in previous conference, I was looking for the novelty. And but I walk into this new rips with a different perspective. I wanted to be more like a summer school. I wanted to learn and not like really like chase the novel because I thought there are several areas that I wanted to work on. And there is a lot of material, like a lot of opportunity. And this year, I think the, the highlights for me were the tutorials and the workshops. They were both amazing for that especially the tutorials. So I, I kind of focus on that. So I tried to go to some orals. I thought they were really bad. So I just <laughs> I kept going back to the tutorials one after the other. And then when I saw it was already Thursday and then I just moved straight to the workshop. So I didn't really do a lot of paper digging, but the papers are going to be there. So um, slowly I, I went through the poster session, wrote down like a bunch of 
papers. If I have like a list of like 50, 60 names, I just have to go through them now. So, uh, Any particular workshops you like? Yeah, so I started with the tutorials. Well, there, there are the industry talks on Sunday. They're actually pretty good. I like it. And what I can highlight about the industry talks and the tutorials is that there were a lot of time for questions. So especially the industry talks, it was like 15 minutes, but there was one hour for questions. And the talk by itself was, you know, like uh, uneventful, but the discussions were really good. And that's where the meat of the thing is. That's why you want to be in the conference and not just watch it on YouTube. I'm sorry, Lucas, were you saying industry, like in businesses? Yeah, industry, yeah. Like, so like what, like a company would speak or something like that? Yeah, they're like uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook AI, or mm -hmm. there's company Neuromagic that does something similar to what we do. Microsoft AI. So yeah. you think those were, were those purchase spots or like these sponsors and then they get to have this kind yeah, of Yeah, I think those are sponsors. Yeah. They are purchase sponsors. It's like the equivalent of an expo. So sometimes they do that really just as, sort of as a recruiting tool, but you said you found that as a good way of organizing the science too. Is that what you're saying? Well, they're, they're a good presentation. They're like science presentation by, by machine learning people. Yeah. Learning emotional talk and a uh, very interesting discussion. You can get like a peek of what's going on inside, you know, and uh, they were like answering all the questions. So that was nice. And one thing I noticed on that and I noticed on tutorials and I noticed on invited talks is that there was a lot of time for questions. There's like one hour for questions and people would not be shy of asking those questions. There were like a lot of stuff going on in the forums. So I, I thought the discussion that generated was even better than in person because in person just like it's always the same people that ask always the same questions. <laughs> but a lot of people, you know, go up and actually ask something. And even me, I don't even ask anything, usually ask anything on those conferences, but uh, I just felt like I wanted to join the conversation. I felt kind of invited. So uh, that was really cool, I have to say. And I, I saw that in our um, Brains at Bay as well. You know, like a lot of people ask questions, a lot online format, a lot, it's uh, even more than the in presence format. Mm -hmm. I attended NIPS like maybe about six years ago and it was smaller, it was growing, it was quadrupling year over year at the time, but there was just like four main industry sponsors, uh, four or five, you know, uh, uh, Netflix, um, uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon, et cetera. And, and when the industry side of it came up, it was interesting, the problems that they encountered in deploying at scale things that you wouldn't really think about, but where the, the stuff would interact with uh, humans. And uh, the uh, Facebook uh, guy, uh, guy was um, talking about how th uh, they would, they would um, basically dynamically change some of their algorithms and then inject them into the stream and see what the results were. So they're dynamically you know, trying things on out. And they would get these weird results that every once in a while they're going along and all of a sudden, you know, the number of clicks that they got just dropped dramatically. And they, what's going on here? And it turns out that someone injected something that they didn't expect. The, the UI, they moved this one click button like four pixels higher next to something else that was more obscure. And then it just human perception being what it was, they, they lost a bunch of clicks, you know, and it was like, you know, they pounded on the guy who had done it, but it was, it was just this, this weird problems that come on up on these bleeding edges that, that that's one of the things I like about the industry stuff is, is, is that uh, you see stuff deployed at scale that you wouldn't think about from an academic point of view would make a, make a difference, but it, but it does. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad they still have something like that going on for you. So well, industry is a pretty big part of machine learning now. It's a, a yeah, I would say most of the papers I saw were industry papers, much more so than academic papers. Yeah, it's unfortunate that the way it is in machine learning. Well, maybe not. So I mean, we have resources being in the industry days, you know. But uh, anyway, um, so on the on the tutorials and workshops, um, I think there is some stuff that I really wanted to see in this conference and I saw it was combining uh, symbolic reasoning with um, deep learning. So there was a tutorial with uh, Francois Collet, Melanie Mitchell and Christian Seged. I think those are three well-known names in the field. Uh, but specifically about that, you know, abstract reasoning and how to combine deep learning with uh, program-based uh, search. And I think it's uh, really uh, forward-looking 
Uh, there's still not a lot of results on the field. So most results are like on the side of, um, uh, of um, mathematical uh, theories, like trying to prove theorems and all, or on the side of, you know, those you, uh, IQ tests like data sets, what is the name? Raven tests like data sets, like ARC and things like all that. So, which are kind of data sets that deep learning doesn't perform well. Like you can try anything. And a lot of people tried anything at it, even like GPT-3 and they don't perform well in those data sets, but program-based search uh, methods perform well. So that's, I think, one of the frontiers that people are exploring now. And there's a whole workshop on this and there was a whole tutorial on this. And I think those are... I don't, I don't have a good sense of what actually, I mean, I, I understand the words, but um, uh, how they actually integrate those two things. And I mean, maybe this is not the right time to talk about it, but if you think it's really useful, maybe sometime you could give like a, you know, five minute overview. Yeah, what that means. I think it's going to be a five minutes, but maybe I can give it an overview at some point. It would be uh, more than five minutes or it would be less than five minutes? <laughs> no, it would be a lot more than five minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I don't, I can't, I can't visualize what it means. I understand the words, but you know. Integrate what? Um, yeah, program. A, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, you say I was trying to read. Yeah, like uh, program synthesis and deep learning. You know, like it's like searching the space of possible programs. Uh, the, the difference is that you have some structure uh, on, you know, because you have- you When you say programs, are you talking about, you're not talking about computer programs, right? You're talking about- uh, Yeah, I'm talking about computer programs. Oh, I misunderstood that. It, it doesn't have to be like, code can be code, but I'm talking about like defining a, a domain specific language and searching in the space of that domain specific language. So there's a, there are a lot, there's a lot of structure to the problem, you know, and, and how you define that. That's, it just struck me as sort of like old AI, you know. Uh, it you know, is, more of a, so, but like, it's how you can use like current deep learning uh, to optimize uh, old AI, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's how I interpret it, not, not like computer program. I, I interpret it as, hey, we need to add this you know, like structured knowledge that someone came up with some schema of, you know, the domain that was like human created and combined that with deep learning. Is, yeah. I, is that right? Yeah, but a DSL can be anything. Like you can define DSLs like for uh, med mathematical formalisms or uh, yeah. language is also a DSL. So any kind of uh, domain specific language you can think about. It used to be called automatic programming was the old, uh, was the old uh, schema where you, you get a set of specifications and then it evolves the algorithms, you know, for that. So those are really cool, at least for me, more for like a learning perspective. I also spent a lot of time on, um, there was a tutorial in approximate inference and I uh, was going over, you know, like the basics of variation inference, uh, MCMC and Bayesian uh, neural networks, which is just something I wanted to learn more about. So I spent quite some time on that. There's also a workshop on that. And there are some things on neuroscience which Karan described. Uh, there is a tutorial. I think you also saw this, Karan, right? The, I think it was yeah, called the neuroscience, yeah. neuroscience and to, and and a, tutorial. A very introductory, like just showing the relationship between neuroscience and, and machine learning, but from several different perspectives. It's kind of cool, like from the perspectives of uh, uh, defining the architecture and from the cognitive science, you know, like defining what functions should be learned. So it was a very high level review, but it was super interesting. And in workshops, there, was also, there were also two, the one from uh, Raymond Chua from Mila, I think that's a biological one, and the one from Cindy Lowe. And let me see. Oh, and, that, and I think for me, the best workshops, uh, one I'm still going through. So one was for meta learning specifically because we were working on that. I think it was a great workshop. It really like broadened my view of meta learning. I knew very little about I still know very little about, but I know more than I knew like last week. And there is another one on self-supervised learning. And that's the one I'm still going to maybe this will tie with, uh, enjoy that one. Uh, um, with, the, with the workshops, do you, do you think they exploited the live stuff well? Um, were, were there, was there a lot of questions and stuff like, like with the other yeah. scenarios? Or could it be just as well done after the fact? You know, could I go back to the workshops and get 90% out of it? You can go back and get everything because everything was recorded. Like even the questions, you know, they answer some questions. You, you, you're not, you're not going to be able to see the questions in the chat, but they answered a lot of the questions after the talks. After each talk, they go and answer the questions. So you can see that in the recording. 
and they have a panel as well. All the workshops have panels. And I think for me, that's always like the meat of it. You know, that's where every question people ask is always the question that are going to my mind as well. So you can you can watch the discussions too. They're always there. And so yeah, you can go after the fact. What else? Yeah, and the workshops I thought was a good blend of old and new. Uh, one of the workshops, which is quite interesting, it's called, I think, ML uh, Retrospective. I don't know if you guys saw that. Uh, that's from the same group that organized ML Collective, plus a lot of other people. And there are a bunch of surveys and, and you know, like discussions of where we are in machine learning, uh, how far have we gotten, how far, uh, where do we have to go. I thought that was very like open-ended and I had not, not like focused on, you know, uh, all this model beats accuracy on that thing tomorrow. That was not the focus at all. But I got, that was really cool. And the, the other workshops, what I realized is they have a really good blend of old and new, like surveying what's out there, uh, some of the new papers we've seen in this conference, and what is the path ahead? What I've, I think it's the interesting question, like where do we have to go? And you could see the perspective from different communities, you know, like meta learning people are like going in one direction, self supervised people are going in another direction. There is some like work uh, between the two fields. Like, I don't know, did you see the cross transformers papers, I think that's one. No, that, yeah. That's one you'd like. I, yeah, I, I think I noted it down. I've got a, a note to myself to look at it, but I haven't looked at it yet. Yeah, I think you should uh, check that one out. So yeah, some 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 papers would like bridge the gap, but you can see that the communities are very you know like close within themselves, and everyone has different ideas of where machine learning should go. <laughs> like the mm -hmm. symbolic reasoning, people have like a lot different idea, and for me it was super interesting just you know being there. Like I I really wanted to watch the whole thing, just like be someone from symbolic reasoning for like one day, <laughs> and and try to like leave that board for one day. So. That's so would idea. you suppose you had a choice between going to a fully online conference and a fully physical one like before, but you could only do one of those, which one would you choose? Well, if I could, I would go to the physical one, of course. <laughs> yeah, I go to the physical one. I mean, uh, the workshops were great. If I could be there in person, they would be even better. But I, I, I love that all the, all the, Informations online, and I'm gonna spend the next two months going through all the videos. So, <laughs> if mm -hmm. I could, both, both, that would be good. Yeah. I don't know.